Okay, so thank you very much. I'm happy to be there. So uh, I will first come, I will talk about galaxies, of course, but I will first begin with a few uh, facts and reflection of my own experience. Uh, I've not been, I've not felt being very discriminated uh, against uh, uh, science here, but uh, I think it's insidious, so I will try to, well, uh, you have seen already this kind of, uh, I don't know if you see the, anyway, uh, you have seen this uh, kind of uh, statistics that uh, uh, girls uh, perform much better than boys in the school. Uh, they have better rating, better diploma, and so on. But when they select their careers, they select uh, different, less rewarding careers with less responsibility and less power. So why? I think it is due to the stereotypes, and uh, we have to, to work on this, in fact. In science, for instance, there is 30% of women researchers, and uh, Nobel Prize is 3% only. So there is also a loss in time, because of course there's a lot of uh, other activities that women have, a family and so on, so they have some gaps in their careers. And uh, there is also some, uh, some problems. So I've taken some statistics in institutes that I know very well, the French Science Academy, just to know about the uh, disciplines where there is more women. You see math, physics, and chemistry, that's six, five percent which is more, mechanics, computer, a little more, and the best is universe science, where we are, and geophysics and astrophysics, it's a good thing. Biology, even if we heard that the bioscience were taken a lot by women, in fact, there is a more 140 uh, uh, people in uh, academics in biology, three sections of biology, there's only 12% women. So there's a problem of the loss in, uh, in their career. In fact, the Collège de France is better, 18% of women. And I have also uh, an example of insidious stereotypes, terror threat. <laughs> and I read this in a paper by uh, Hugue and Lenner. Oops, sorry. And um, here you see that uh, there, there was a test uh, on uh, girls and boys, uh, uh, showing them a very complex uh, diagram that you see here. They have a few minutes to, to read them and to remember and to retrace after a while. <laughs> And um, they were told either it's a geometry, a math test, or a drawing, artistic test. And uh, the answer was when it was a geometry test, the girls were very bad. And when it was an artistic drawing test, they performed the, the boys. So it's only in their mind because they were, it was exactly the same test, of course. So you see that even with girls, when they were uh, asked, they were not... Uh, taking into the, they were not influenced by the stereotypes. In fact, they are. In fact, it is uh, insidious. It is unconscious. So I think uh, we have a lot of work to do. Okay, so I'm changing topics now and um, going uh, farther away. The content of the universe. I think uh, for galaxy formation, we have a lot of problems here because uh, we don't know exactly uh, of what matter the galaxies are are, are of. They are done of variance. Well, I think uh, you don't see anything, so I have to forget about the pointer. <laughs> so um, the variance are only 5% of the total. We know from uh, 20 years ago that uh, there is dark energy, 70%. I will not talk about at all, but just to know that 70% dark energy. And uh, what is making the galaxies are variance and dark matter. Dark matter is 25%. When I say baryons, I say protons and neutrons, that is ordinary matter that we are all made of. And dark matter, we don't know at all. It's uh, exotic and unknown particles that we have never seen, neither in accelerators nor in uh, space. So we don't know even their mass, their nature, or whatever. The only thing that they don't interact with anything, with photons, they don't interact. That's why they are dark. In fact, they are not dark, they are really transparent more. They don't interact, and we can see through the dark matter. The dark energy is a repulsive force. It's uh, f filling all the space, and it accelerates the expansion of the universe that we have recently found that it was accelerating. In fact, the total, um, total um, uh, density and energy, omega, is exactly the critical density, 10 to the minus 29 gram per, per cubic centimeter. You, you know the order of magnitude is very small, but at least it's just sufficient to have a, a geometry which is flat. You know that from general relativity that uh, the content of the universe is related to the geometry. 
So we are in a, a space where the, there is zero curvature, that is a photons travel in uh, straight lines. And when I say that uh, we have 5% of our general matter, the yellow part here, but even in the yellow part, we don't see every baryon. There's a lot of missing baryons. Uh, what we see, when you look at the night sky, you see the galaxies and the stars, and this is only 6% of the baryons that are in the universe, so we, we see very little because 6% of 5% is 0.3%. So uh, the content of the universe, we see only 0.3%. There is some uh, in a hot gas and some in Lyman alpha forest. I will explain why this uh, is, is possible to see them anyhow. Uh, you see in the bottom right that uh, when you make a simulation of uh, formation of galaxies, you find a cosmic web of filaments. The uh, white dots are galaxies. And all this uh, red uh, stuff is dark matter and baryons. We think that all majority of baryons are in the filament. They are not in galaxies, maybe 80% or more. And we want to test what are they. In fact, uh, we have quasars. Quasars are beacons. They are very powerful lights. They are nuclei of galaxies. They can radiate a thousand times more than their galaxies. And we can see quasars very far uh, in the universe. And uh, when we go far, we... Uh, uh, look back in time, and we can look back in time until the beginning, the Big Bang, and we have quasars near the Big Bang, and then we have absorption. Uh, all the matter that is uh, in, uh, in front of the quasar to our, towards our telescopes is in gas, in this filament. These filaments are not radiating at all because they are very diffuse, but they are absorbing. So you see all these lines. There is a line here which is, well, maybe I can use the, yes, the mouse here. You see here the uh, line of the emission of the quasar, Lyman alpha is the main uh, line of hydrogen. And all this uh, between the quasar and us at the left is the forest. What we call the forest is because there are so many absorption lines. Each absorption line is a gas cloud in front of the quasars. You have sometimes a galaxy, which is the damped line. And all this is called the forest. So you see how many... Uh, gas cloud we have, and we can just uh, trace and sample the filaments uh, of the, the filaments which are in between galaxies, and we are not radiating. And for this, we can deduce that maybe 80%, 18% of the baryons are in this shape, that is gas, which is ionized. We have to correct, of course, this is Lyman alpha is the line of uh, the hydrogen atom, but we think that there are, since we see uh, silicium, carbon, and nitrogen and so on, we know that it is ionized, we correct by factor 1,000, and then we find that there is 18% of the gas which is ionized in the filaments. Maybe there are some more that we have never seen, but it is warm hot, that is, it's not too hot since we would have seen it in X-ray. It's not cold, we have seen it in the alpha. So it's in a, in a shape, in a temperature where it's impossible to see it, so 5-10% maybe. And then you see that you, when you sum all these that we have uh, identified, there is two-thirds of the baryons that are not identified. So what are they? <coughs> in fact, we, have, uh, we know uh, that they are not in a compact shape, that they are not in uh, stars, uh, dead stars, like a black hole or neutron stars, because they would have deflected the light from uh, stars that are in the background. And this has been done 20 years ago, experiments of microlensing, that is, uh, we look at uh, millions of stars in the Magellanic clouds, uh, nearby galaxy, and if there were a lot of very compact, like uh, brown dwarfs, uh, red dwarfs, and so on, we would have seen them, and they are not. So we think that all these baryons are in gas, uh, diffused gas. They are either ionized or uh, dense uh, and uh, cold clouds. And uh, we have made a model, for instance, uh, to explain why it is possible that uh, galaxies are linked in the filaments. Here you find uh, Nedron galaxies in blue with a bulge and a adjoint disk. And galaxies are not isolated, as you see in the simulation. They are linked to all the cosmic web by filaments. So the, here is one of the filaments in green. And you see there may be some clumps, very dense clumps of uh, hydrogen. And when the hydrogen is dense, it becomes molecular. And when you are in the molecular gas, H2, uh, it's impossible to see because this molecule is uh, symmetric. There's no dipole. It's not radiating. It's not absorbing. So you can uh, hide a lot of gas in this. And, of course, the problem was to know why it's not... Uh, oops. Sorry. Go back. Okay. 
and uh, so um, and the problem was to know how this uh, gas was stable and not forming stars. And in fact, it was because it is in a fractal structure. And I show you some models of fractals that is like uh, uh, Russian dolls embedded. And in this, we have a lot of experiment in fractals, but the best fractals in the interstellar medium, in fact, it's a nine order of magnitude in, in scale. And when the dimension of the fractal is uh, 1.8 or less than two, in projection, you, you see that uh, 2.2 and 1.8. So in projection, which is in a 2D uh, surface, then you have a, a changing structure. You can have a very, very small filling factor in surface. So uh, here it was uh, a model in 3D. And indeed, when you look at these uh, molecular clouds, when they are in galaxies, it's possible to see them because they are, uh, they are enriched by um, uh, heavy elements like carbon, oxygen, and uh, nitrogen that are forming stars. And then the CO molecule can trace this. And you see that uh, they are indeed in a fractal structure with uh, this kind of uh, dimension, 1.7. So if you extrapolate in the filaments where there is no metals, then you can see that uh, there could be a lot of uh, cold gas. That is very interesting because uh, they explain why galaxies are fueled by this gas. All this gas of the cosmic web is falling in galaxies. And this explains why galaxies are still forming stars today. Now, let's uh, go on to the true dark matter, which is uh, done with uh, exotic particles that we don't know. Well, there are several kinds of dark matter, hot, warm, or cold. In fact, the best dark matter is cold. The, the standard model that is uh, adopted by a majority of people are the cold dark matter model, CDM. And why? In fact, you see here three uh, numerical simulations of uh, uh, the universe, the formation of structure, with uh, uh, assuming that uh, the dark matter is cold, warm, and hot. And what does it mean, this temperature? It means that the particles, when they are decoupling from the expansion of the universe, that is, when the particles are not annihilating anymore. In fact, uh, dark matter particles are their own antiparticles because they have no charge and so on. So they annihilate at the beginning when the universe is very dense. And when the universe is expanding, it is diffused, then the particles don't interact anymore and they stop their annihilation and their abundance is a relic abundance, it's a remaining. So uh, when they uh, decouple like that, they either they are hot, that is like uh, neutrinos, for instance. We know that uh, common neutrinos, electric neutrinos, have a small amount of mass, maybe electron volt mass, and they are very hot, that is when they decouple, they are relativistic. So this means that they uh, create a pressure that prevents the uh, structure to form. So you see here, when you have a hot dark matter, you don't form the small scale structure, you just form big filaments. When you are, have a coal that is a massive particle that's not relativistic at decoupling, that there's no pressure at all, and in the cold dark matter model here, you can form a lot of structure at the beginning in the filaments. And this works much better with the uh, observations. And uh, the best uh, candidate for this dark matter, which are the WIMPs here, with interactive massive particles, is the neutralino. Why? Because it is uh, beyond the standard model. In the standard model of particles, you don't have any dark matter particle, but you can uh, extrapolate and see, well, there is a supersymmetric particle, which uh, each particle fermions is, has a companion, which is a boson, and the boson have a fermion, and so on. This comes from the super strings, uh, and so on. But I will not enter into that. Maybe uh, Robino will uh, do, do that uh, tomorrow. And um, the main uh, mass, mass of the particle, the order of magnitude of the particle is 100 GeV, which means a GeV is the mass of the proton, so it's 100 times the mass of the proton. And why this? It's because you have to annihilate this particle at the beginning and to find exactly now 25%, the abundance that we see in, uh, in astrophysics, 25% of the dark matter. So if it was not that mass, it would be more than 25% or less than 25%, but you need this mass to have um, an uh, agreement with observation. So now this CDM model works very well to form the large-scale structure. You see a comparison here between observations here in blue. In blue, uh, each point in blue is a galaxy. So you make a survey. This is observation. You make a slice in the universe. You have uh, uh, walls, big walls like that, small walls. And uh, in the same manner, you can make slice in the simulation. And uh, you see in red the simulation with CDM. So we have the impression that the structure, the power spectrum of the structure are the same. 
of course, it's not a one by one uh, structure, but the, the power spectrum, the uh, shape of the walls and so on, are about uh, reproduced. So it's very well. But the problem is that uh, when you look at the scale of galaxies, there are many problems with the CDM. And these problems are of many sorts. I will just put two, uh, which are maybe the main ones, is when you make a simulation of dark matter, uh, all the dark matter uh, make a peak of density in the center of galaxies. This is called a cusp here, and it is illustrated by this peak of density here, which is predicted. What we see is, uh, is not a cusp at all. It's a flat distribution of density is observed. How do we observe that? We observe that because in galaxies you have a dynamical mass. You have uh, stars and gas rotating around the center so that we can uh, deduce the mass within uh, these uh, rotating uh, particles. And then we know that there, are, uh, there is a, a core, in fact. Uh, also, we have the prediction of a large number of satellites around each galaxy. For instance, here is a simulation of the Milky Way halo. And you see in uh, yellow here, that is a halo of the Milky Way. And around there is a 1,000, and some simulation, 2,000 or 3,000 satellites, uh, dark matter satellites, that we don't see. In fact, uh, around the Milky Way, we, we see 12 uh, satellites. We have uh, dwarf galaxies. We have the Magellanic clouds and so on. But we, we count that. It's far uh, less than 1,000. Here is an illustration of the problem of the cusp. Here you have, as a function of radius, the density of dark matter predicted. And uh, you have uh, a power law in density, which is 1 or 1.5. You see that's a peak here. Why what we observed is really a plateau, what we call a core here. There's uh, not at all a peak of density. And this is even true for dwarf galaxies, which are dominated completely by dark matter. There's no stars to perturb the, the estimation. And uh, here, if I uh, try to, yes. So this is a simulation of dark matter filaments. You see, uh, you can travel through this millennium uh, simulation. Uh, all the colors are only the density, tracing density, uh, uh, the, only the dark matter is simulated. And you see how many uh, uh, satellites you have uh, around every, uh, here you have, for instance, a galaxy, and you see that there's a lot, a lot, a lot of small-scale structure that is too, too many satellites that are not observed. So this is one of the big problems. And uh, to solve this problem of too much small-scale structure, uh, people have tried to find other, other candidates. Here you uh, have a recall of the, uh, in colors, the quarks here, the neutrinos, the electrons, and in red you have the bosons of the interaction. All this is the whole um, structure of the standard model of uh, particles, elementary particles. And then you know that uh, these neutrinos, that you know very well, neutrino electronics and the three flavors here, are of left chirality. So maybe it's more satisfying to have a symmetric things. Uh, you can extend the sterile to sterile neutrino with a right chirality, and there will be maybe uh, three flavors just to be symmetric to the three flavors you know in the well-known uh, neutrinos. We don't know if these neutrinos exist, but they are called sterile. Why? Because they are not interacting at all with the rest. We, we can detect uh, active neutrinos, a new E, that we detect from the sun. We can have also detected in uh, neutrino telescopes neutrinos from the supernovae coming from the Magellanic cloud and so on. So these are active, although they can uh, cross the, the Earth without uh, <laughs> encountering some, anything. They are weak interaction, but at least they are detected. But these will be uh, sterile because they are not interacting with anything. So why not? And of course, uh, um, if we put it, well, here you have EV or less, much less than EV. Here we put KEV, so it's uh, massive enough to have an influence in the dark matter. And uh, since they will be uh, relativistic at, uh, at uh, decoupling, they will be a warm dark matter. So warm dark matter, it's still possible. You destroy a, a small scale structure, so it's good for the problem of CDM but uh, it is still possible to have warm dark matter. But we have now constraints on the mass of warm dark matter, this uh, elusive neutrinos. For instance, you still uh, look at the Lyman alpha forest that I have already described, all this absorption in front of quasars. We have now a lot of quasars 
with a, a lot of forest. And you see one example here. So it's a 1D structure. You have in green the simulation of a, a warm dark matter. And um, in green, uh, green, sorry, green is a CDM. And in blue and black is a warm dark matter with a some mass of the particle. And so you can constrain that they should have a mass larger than 3 keV, uh, not to destroy too much the small-scale structure that we see in the Lehman Alpha Forest. Now we have uh, more quasars and we have even more 4 keV uh, constraints. So it's becoming less and less possible because it's becoming more uh, cold dark matter. So since we have a lot of uh, difficulties, and one of these difficulties also that we have not seen in the LHC the supersymmetry, so it will maybe come, but we have no candidate at all in the LHC. So the question for dark matter is to be or not to be, of course. And uh, since because uh, either there is a degeneracy here, it was always like that for 30 years, that either you uh, apply the Newton law or the Einstein uh, general relativity everywhere, and then you need a lot of dark matter and also a lot of dark energy as well. I think that was like a taboo to modify general relativity until 1998, where we discovered this dark energy. And then uh, people realized that it was mandatory to change general relativity anyway for dark energy. So now we have uh, the taboo is off, and uh, we, we also have this possibility for dark matter. So since 95% is a dark sector now, uh, and the dark sector is only, the only manifestation of the dark sector is through gravitation. So if you change gravity, if you have a modified gravity, you can get rid of all the dark sector and have only ordinary matter. So this is appealing, and a lot of people are try, trying to work on this uh, <coughs> modified gravity. One uh, best for galaxies was this of Moti Milgram, uh, a, f a physician from Israel that uh, did uh, this hypothesis in 83, so it's the exactly at the time where uh, we realized that the dark matter was exotic particles. Before 83, it was only baryonic dark matter. Now it's uh, from 93, it was exotic. We know that we need 25%, and uh, this is not possible for, for instance, uh, primordial nucleosynthesis. So the idea of uh, Moti Milgram, which works very well for galaxy, is to say uh, you have to modify gravity at a weak field, in the weak field, at a low acceleration. Acceleration is acceleration of uh, gravity, is m over r square, okay? And uh, the critical uh, acceleration is 10 to the minus 10 meter per square uh, second, that is 10 to the minus 11 g, g being the acceleration of uh, gravity on Earth. So it's very, very small, and that's why uh, all in the uh, solar system until uh, 10,000 AU, that is, AU is the distance from Earth to Sun. So you go 10,000 more, and you are always in a strong field. You are never in a weak field. So here, oh, sorry. Yes. So here you see in this diagram here that uh, you plot the dynamical mass to the visible mass. So when you need the dark matter, the dynamical mass measured from the gravity, the velocity, and so on, is much larger than the visible mass by a factor 10 here. And uh, when you are in strong field, it is one. You don't need at all dark matter. For instance, in the solar system, you don't need dark matter at all. So uh, when you are in a strong field, you don't need. When you are in a weak field, you need. That's why in the Milky Way, for instance, you don't need dark matter until the sun radius. You need only a halo of dark matter outside when the... There is a weak field. In dwarf galaxies, when the, the field is weak from the start, you need a lot of dark matter from the center of the dwarf galaxy. So dwarf galaxies are completely dominated by dark matter, but not big galaxies. So this works very well. And you see that uh, uh, when you are below this uh, acceleration, you just make a geometric mean of the Newtonian acceleration, which varies with R, and this A0, which is constant. So instead of 1 over R square, it's 1 over R. And you can explain all the uh, flat velocity curve of galaxies. And it's not uh, only one galaxy that you can reproduce. You can reproduce all curves of the thousands of galaxies that we have observed. You can see a dwarf galaxy here rotating only at 80 kilometers per second. The points are the data and uh, what is due to stars and gas is here. All is due to dark matter from the start, and you can reproduce with, uh, with this uh, 
Mond uh, regime. And when there is a big galaxy, 250 km per second rotation, the stars are enough until a certain radius, which uh, is equivalent of the solar radius in our galaxy, and then you need dark matter in the outer parts. And uh, so since it is an acceleration, which is the limit between the two regimes, you can also think about the surface density. An acceleration is m over r square, so the surface density. Every time you are below the surface density, you need to, to change or boost the gravity. Well, we have tried to, um, to test this theory, to know if uh, you can do all the observed picture of galaxies and the stability of galaxies, because in general it was said by Ostriker and Peebles in the 70s that you need a dark matter halo to stabilize galaxies, because they will be completely uh, uh, unstable without. So we tried to see if without dark matter halo and only with the MOND regime you can do the stability, and yes, you can reproduce bars, spirals, spiral waves. You can reproduce here the observation, here the simulation. In fact, it is completely degenerate. Either you put a Newton law and a dark matter halo, or a MOND uh, law without any dark matter, and it gives the same result. So it's a pity that we cannot disentangle these two cases. Maybe we had some hope with the interaction of galaxies, because uh, in the interaction of two galaxies, they merge very quickly, <coughs> and we, we know why, because <coughs> in the merger of galaxies, you have to uh, get rid of the angular momentum and the energy of the galaxies. Uh, if not, they will rotate a long time, the one around each other. And in the MON regime, you have no dark matter halo to accept all the angular momentum and the energy. And here is a simulation in the uh, dark matter halo. In red, you have the dark matter. In blue, you have the, well, maybe I can uh, re-show you this. So in red, you have the dark matter, in blue, the baryons. And you see that they merge in one turn only. So there's so much dynamical friction that if the dark matter is deforming the galaxies and uh, it's accepting argumentum. So the question was to know if it was possible to merge also in the MON regime. Here you see the simulation of CDM, exactly that the movie has shown. And here the observation, you have the antennae, two galaxies in the process of merging with the tidal tails. And um, we assume that they are merging as fast as in CDM, it is in one turn they are merging. But in fact, uh, we succeed in, um, in making this also, uh, here's the observation and the MOND simulation, uh, exactly what we see in the sky. The problem is that it is uh, not merging at the first passage. It has to rotate three times before merging. And this you don't know, in fact, because what you observe is uh, a certain number of galaxies in this state, and we don't know if there are many mergers uh, which are very short, or there are small number of mergers which uh, last a long time, and this is completely degenerate. So again, we cannot differentiate between the uh, modified gravity and the Newton with dark matter halo. So it's a pity, but all, uh, all the, both, uh, both uh, models works as well. But uh, this uh, modified gravity doesn't, works very well for galaxies, but not for the large scale structure. That's a problem. Uh, for galaxy clusters, you have not enough um, the acceleration, the weak field here is not weak enough to have enough boost of the gravity here. So you, you solve partly half the dark matter problem and not enough. And you can measure the dark matter from the X-ray gas that you observed here. If it is in a hydrostatic equilibrium, you can deduce the mass. You can deduce also the mass from greater lenses. Here you see a galaxy cluster and you see arcs here, a red arc, a blue arc. And all these are uh, the galaxies, light from the galaxies behind that have been uh, deflected uh, by the cluster. The cluster is like an optical lens that um, put deformations in the galaxy behind. And you can deduce here the mass of the cluster. And then uh, when you put uh, these uh, figures in, you find that uh, in the cluster, when you have only Newton without any dark matter, you have more dynamical mass than the visible mass. When you put the uh, modified gravity it solves a bit, uh, but uh, still you are above the middle mass, so you have to add some more invisible mass, which could be either cold gas or neutrinos, but at least 
It's not very satisfying because uh, when we modify gravity, we want to get rid completely of invisible mass and not uh, adding uh, a little bit of uh, dark matter. And also there is this uh, bullet cluster, which is uh, the only uh, event that uh, can separate dark matter to visible matter. Here you have uh, two clusters that have been in collision. And in red, you see the hot gas that is uh, observed in X-ray only, <clears throat> which is 100 million degrees. And you see that since it is a gas, it has uh, felt the collision. It has been uh, slowed down by the collision. Uh, the small uh, cluster here has already crossed the big one and has this uh, characteristic shape, a bow shock here. And the angle of the bow shock gives you the velocity, it's Mach 3. So you have a 4,700 km per second of velocity. It's not possible to measure by Doppler effect because it is in the plane of the sky. You see this collision uh, in parallel here. So you know the velocity. In blue, you have the total mass, that is mainly the dark matter, which is derived from the gravitational lensing. I've shown you that there are some arcs, some shear, and we can deduce the total mass. And the uh, galaxies are in white here. So the galaxies and the dark matter don't see each other. They collide without seeing, so they were stopping. So we can deduce from this kind of collision the limit on the uh, collisional cross-section of dark matter because some people have also tried to find that there was collision between particles of dark matter. We don't know, but at least we have a constraint. They don't collide because they, they pass through each other, while the gas, uh, the main variants are in the gas, the hot gas, and they are dissociated from uh, this, uh, this um, observed uh, dark matter. So uh, this is also a problem for the modified gravity things. Okay, so I've tried to give you uh, some elements of the puzzle. Uh, first, we find that the galaxy we see, and also the X-ray hot gas that you don't see by eye, is only 0.5% of the total of the content of the universe. The ordinary matter is 5%, but there are still some variants missing. Uh, about the exotic dark matter, we don't know at all what are these particles. Uh, until recently, we had this uh, neutralino, but we don't see it in uh, LHC. We have seen 125 uh, GeV, so just at the same order of magnitude, the Higgs boson in 2012. But now we are 10 times more energy and we don't see any more the neutralino. So now the masses of the candidates can be uh, even not thermal, 10 to the minus 22 EV, which is a, a new uh, actions, uh, fuzzy dark matter that is now developed more until 10 to the 12. So you see the 34 orders of magnitude. That means that we don't know anything. Uh, it is searched directly uh, for diode detection in tunnels, like uh, in Gran Sasso. We have uh, this uh, uh, xenon, uh, one ton of ze liquid xenon uh, that is, uh, have a very, very good upper limits. Uh, about neutrinos, that would mean uh, warm dark matter. We have upper limits now, constraints that mix, uh, well, either they are uh, thermal or uh, made by uh, resonances. I don't go into the detail, but there are more and more massive constraints that is... Uh, almost a cold dark matter. So another solution would be uh, the bionic physics uh, to uh, resolve the problem of cold dark matter in galaxies. Okay, And then uh, you have also the modified gravity uh, in introducing the fifth force. So you see that uh, this man is very lost here in trying to make the puzzle with uh, 10,000 pieces of dark matter. And uh, I think uh, he needs a lot of women in science to have creativity and to solve the problem. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Françoise, uh, for this uh, dreaming trip in uh, dark matter things and galaxy. Any questions, comments? So, <clears throat> so from the bullet cluster results, we can have constraints on the, the cross-section and mass of dark matter, as you showed. But using even those constraints, do you know what's the status of self-interacting dark matter models in solving the core cusp or satellite galaxy problem? In fact, it does not work very well uh, because uh, um, the, um, the core are one kiloparsec or so, and uh, if you want to have exactly the size of the core for each galaxy, because it depends from galaxy to galaxy, you have to have a, a cross-section which depends on the galaxy. So people, well, at the first it was not operating, and people have tried to find a cross-section which is inversely proportional to the velocity. 
So, of course, small galaxies have a small velocity, a big uh, cross-section. And for instance, in clusters, in galaxy clusters, you have a cusp. So if it is an entity, you have a, a high velocity dispersion, so the cross-section is zero, and you can still return a cusp. So they are uh, putting another uh, parameter that the cross-section must depend on the velocity. But still then, I think it doesn't work very well, because then by collision, you make a dark matter which is spherical because it's random collision in everything. And when you measure by uh, gravitational lensing and also by other means, the shape of dark matter, they are ellipticals. They are not spherical, this course. So um, I think it's not a, a very good uh, solution. So, so in your opinion, because it's an, it's an unsolved problem, that uh, how would we... Uh, you know, think of solving the satellite galaxy problem and the core cast because CDM is definitely having those two problems in small scales. Yes. And, and uh, is it like interaction with dark matter? I don't know. I mean, how, how do you solve no, it? Interaction warm, dark matter, warm dark matter uh, or something? Uh, I don't know really. In fact, I'm not the alone to not, not know. <laughs> but uh, people have tried hard for decades now to have this feedback uh, in fact, uh, it works a little bit for dwarf galaxies. You have star formation feedback. So if you have a lot of supernovae, since the potential well is quite uh, shallow, you can uh, prevent the star to form and have... Uh, but um, then it comes back. So you have to uh, difficulty to, come, uh, to prevent the gas to come back. And also, uh, all the um, dwarfs that we have seen in the vicinity of the uh, Milky Way, are not corresponding to the dwarfs we expect in CDM. Even if you suppress 80% of dwarfs, they are completely dark and you have uh, removed, uh, I think, uh, the, the um, galaxy like Fornax, Draco, and all the satellites have more stars than you expect in the prediction of CDM. So they, have, they are dominated by dark matter, but still they have a lot of stars that you don't predict. So it's by orders of magnitude. So even the dwarfs that you see, are not uh, compatible with CDM. So there, there's a big problem, not only of uh, feedback, it's not sufficient. So there are some uh, ideas of fuzzy dark matter. You know this uh, uh, dark matter is 10 to the minus 22 EV, so the, the Bragg length would be one kiloparsec. So we have quantum effects at one kiloparsec size, which is very surprising. But, and then you have fluctuations, quantum fluctuations at kiloparsec size. And this quantum fluctuation could uh, they are renewed. They are always there. It's not like star, uh, feedback of stars that are, can uh, remove uh, some uh, cusp and then it comes back. In fact, you have um, a fluctuation, quantum fluctuation, that can uh, prevent maybe the, the core to form, uh, the cusp to form and form a core, and it is uh, definitive. So some people are developing this fuzzy dark matter. Rohini? <coughs> I just uh, wanted to get... Uh, your perspective as an astrophysicist, that even if we forgot about LHC, let's just not think that LHC existed. If you were giving this talk independent of LHC, and as she said, the CDM has this issue right now, both the missing satellites and the cusp core, would you, as an astrophysicist, think that maybe MOND has a better chance at the end of the day to be successful? No. I mean, I, as a particle physicist, I had always thought that the till you people did the work that the bullet cluster data was telling you that MOND is wrong. Yeah, the, so the MOND, I just uh, want to get your perspective. The, the MOND ID as, uh, as a, it is now, that is there, there was also a TVS, uh, as you know, a tensor vector, a covariant uh, mm -hmm. shape of MOND. And as it is now, it doesn't work. Yeah. But you can say the same thing for CDM. As it is now, it doesn't work. So we have two, two theories that uh, one works for galaxies, the other for large-scale structure, and uh, nothing works very well. So it is in work. I would say it's a uh, work in progress. So I, I'm completely agnostic. Would it be modified gravity or a dark matter particle? I don't know at all. But at least we have to work in the two directions because uh, I'm not sure that uh, the gra modified gravity, not MOND exactly, but another modified gravity which uh, would cope with the large-scale structure will work. you know, uh, multi-component dark matter, mm -hmm. which is uh, 
bit which uses a bit of the fuzzy dark matter things because then we kind of trying to say that you have CDM which helps you in the, the, the large scale the structures that you need. And then you have this uh, beam, uh, axions uh, like things which help you to sort out the yeah. problems with cusp and core. So again, well, multi, uh, well, why not, of course, but uh, I think that you have then too many free parameters and you will always succeed to, to find the universe. And but the main problem in CDM, I would say it's also the problem of galaxy, but the main thing is that you have no particle. And people uh, try to forget about that. Uh, if you add several other particles, like action, uh, neutrino, and it's even more. Uh, the big, big, big problem of this is that we have no idea of if the particle exists or not. And this is uh, the main problem of CDM, is that there is no candidate of this particle. Yeah, that was the best part of supersymmetry. Yes, it, came it was very good. From completely until different reasons. And it, but I want to just share one piece of information with you. Is that particle physicists, okay, we have not found any one of the extensions of standard model we thought of. But almost every extension of the standard model will always have some kind of a CDM uh, 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 candidate simply because these models have to have additional symmetries just to be consistent with what we see now. Mm -hmm. So there is this existence of this kind of particle is almost natural in no matter what kind of new physics you think of. Yes, in theory, yes. In now, theory. in observation, I would in be theory. very happy that uh, one particle is observed somewhere. <laughs> Some evidence of this particle. Uh, so you've uh, rejected the uh, hypothesis of a compact object as being uh, dark matter from the micro lensing. However, uh, I've read that uh, since the recent uh, detection of gravitation wave and the population of massive black hole, people are going again into this idea uh, and the possibility of having a dark matter formed by a primordial black hole. You haven't listed this as a possibility in your talk. What's your opinion about this? Well, in fact, uh, it's not a very, very good candidate, in fact. I, I understand that uh, this uh, gravitational wave detection of the merger of two black holes, they are very massive. But all the black holes that have been detected by uh, gravitational waves are exactly expected from the end of life of the stars. They are nothing new, nothing that was not expected. So uh, you don't need primordial black holes to explain this. But uh, primordial black holes, when you look, there's not only the constraints of uh, micro lensing, some range of mass are completely excluded. There's also the interaction with neutron stars that uh, mean that if there was too many of these uh, primordial black holes, they will interact with neutron star and destroy them. And we see a lot of pulsars that uh, is not destroyed at all. So we have a lot, when you look at the range of masses, of course the small mass are have evaporated from the beginning of the, it's, it's until 10 to the 15 grams. It's completely uh, annihilated. And uh, you, you see that all the range of masses is completely excluded. So people are trying, well, it, a little mass here, little mass here, little mass here, but it's completely uh, artificial, ad hoc. Why there will be a delta function here and not uh, a range of masses and so on. For, for me, it's completely ruled out already, these primordial black holes. Of course, it's only primordial black holes. It was black holes from uh, the life uh, end of uh, stars. It's completely ruled out because the stars would have uh, ejected all their elements, and it would be uh, 10 or 100 times more elements that we see today. So it's not the uh, normal black holes. It's only primordial black holes. But even that, uh, I think it's already excluded. <laughs> One more question? Comment? Yeah. Comments about the primordial black holes. So apart from the observations you said, there are also CMB constraints. So you have Hawking radiation from, the, from those primordial black holes, and that would have effect on the CMB. So from yes. CMB also, the PBH, primordial Actually, black holes, is you. kind you of ruled out. CMB, ruled out yes. yeah. So I think it's it's very bad uh, candidate. <laughs> okay, we can thank again uh, Françoise.